Do you have the courage to break your life lie? Welcome, my Mere Mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Kyron, host of the Mere Mortals podcast, but also this one where I dive deeper into the books that I'm reading to give you the juicy information, to take out some themes, and perhaps to even improve your life, which is what we do have today. It is The Courage to be Disliked by Ichiro Kishimi and Fumitaki Koga. So as you can tell by the Japanese names, this was published in Japan originally in 2013, uh, translated, I think, in 2017, and it's about 270 pages in length, Took me four or five hours to get through in total. It's not super, super dense. So it's a Japanese version of a self-help book slash psychology book, which showcases Adlerian psychology. So this is a type of psychology developed in the early 1900s by Alfred Adler. And it does this through the means of a Socratic dialogue. So in this case, we have two participants. We have the philosopher and the youth. And they have these discussions that take the course over five nights. And that's how this book is set out in terms of the, the actual chapters and whatnot. So we have the first night denying trauma. The second night, all problems are interpersonal relationship problems. The third night, discard other people's tasks. The fourth night, where the center of the world is. And the fifth night, to live in earnest in the here and now. So they have this dialogue where essentially the youth comes in. And he's asking for advice from the philosopher um, slash being very uncooperative, trying to disprove this uh, philosopher wrong. And then they have these back and forth talking about uh, Adlerian psychology and, and how he uses this in his own life. Now, this book is mostly a showcasing one. So in in, in particular, the psychology is, is not a, a thing. It's not a doing one. So it's not going to give you practi- practical, actionable ad- advice. You know, wake up early and get stuff done in the day. Try and get eight hours sleep you know, eat healthily, exercise, all those sorts of things. No, it's not about that. It's really about improving, I suppose, your mental health and the way that you view and see the world and interpret the world. So I'm going to jump now onto the actual authors themselves and they somewhat reflect the characters. Uh, We have uh, Ichiro Kishimi. So this is the older one of the two. Uh, He has a master's in philosophy, was born in 1956 and has really dived deeper into Adlerian psychology. So I suppose he's the expert in this case. And then we have the author, the writer, the younger of the two, uh, Fumitaki Koga, who was born in 1973. So you can see there's this almost 20 year age gap between them as well, somewhat reflective of maybe the the two characters in the book. And he's the one who actually wrote this and, you know, did it in the style of a Socratic dialogue. I'm going to go on to the first theme, and this is Adlerian psychology. The pill pill. I'm going to explain what that means shortly. So Adler was part of the Vienna circle and so was contemporaries of Freud and Jung and basically came up with his own psychology, his his own methodology, I suppose, after breaking with Freud and Jung. And so his is very pro-individual. Everything is somewhat subjective. Uh, even the interpretations of objective things. And so you spend a lot of time in this book really emphasizing the individual and it's not about how you fit in with the group, it's, it's about your own psychological needs. So if we jump over to here onto page 103, I can explain parts of this. So philosopher, that's right. Thank you for remembering it. Freudian etiology is a psychology of possession and eventually arrives at determinism. Adlerian psychology, on the other hand, is a psychology of use and it is you who decides it, youth. Adlerian psychology is a psychology of courage and at the same time, it is a psychology of use, dot, dot, dot. Philosopher, we humans are not so fragile as to simply be at the mercy of etiological cause and effect traumas. From the standpoint of teleology, we choose our lives and our lifestyles ourselves. We have the power to do that. So it's very much talking how you have the power. You can choose what you want to do. And so this is the the pill that I'm somewhat talking about. There's all these things, the red pill, the blue pill, the Bitcoin orange pill, the white God pill, the whatever pill you want to choose. There is a uh, all of this deriving, of course, from the matrix where it's got the blue and the red pill. But essentially that you're, you can choose what's, what you want to believe. And this is very much the same. You can choose the pill that will get you the results. And it's very much talking about what kind of pill maybe you want to accept. Do you want to accept one which is more personal responsibility? Do you want to choose one which is more playing the victim? Do you want to choose X or do you want to choose Y? And so it's sort of basically starting off with this point, you're free to choose, you can do whatever you want. 
Now there's a few layered concepts in here, but not too much, I suppose, in compared to other types of psychology that I've gone into. So it, it seems to be a relatively simple framework. It's not overly complex or, and, in how you approach it. The complexity comes with the actual application. You come in with a set of problems and it's like, okay, here's the fundamental things that you can do to, to help improve these, these problems that you're having, having, but it's going to rely a lot on you. You have to be the one to think of what it is that is troubling you, diving deeper into your own mind and, and fixing these sorts of things. And I should even say, maybe it's not even diving into your own mind in a past sense, because it's very future focused. There's a lot of things in here, which is somewhat denying the past, pretending the past doesn't even exist. So a couple of the chapters are, for example, trauma does not exist. So this is saying, you know, don't even look now. Uh, your life has decided here and now. People always choose not to change. And, you know, then it goes on to a, unpack this a little bit because it does seem to start off quite, quite heavy and, and the simplicity is almost mm, confusing in a way because it's like, oh, this is, this is too simple. This is where it gets onto somewhat maybe a lot of responsibility um, and it can come across as, as rather harsh. Everything is your fault. If you are having a problem, it is your problem and you have caused it. It's not external factors because you're choosing how to respond to these external factors, i.e. This, there's this objective thing happening. Um, you've got cancer or something or your mum has cancer, but it's how you choose to in interpret that is, is what this Adlerian psychology is really getting into. So I'm going to jump here into page 130 here where we see how this, I suppose, manifests or how this uh, comes out when the youth is having this, this problem with his boss. His, his, his boss is essentially a tyrant and being very mean and saying like, you know, that, this sounds exactly like my boss. This person who's always yelling, uh, the boss doesn't acknowledge his efforts, never really listens to what he says. And so here we go. The philosopher, this is Adler's life lie again. I can't do my work because I've been shunned by my boss. It's the boss's fault that my work isn't going well. The person who says such things is bringing up the existence of the boss as an excuse for the work that doesn't go well. Much like the female student with the fear of blushing, it's actually that you need the existence of an awful boss because then you can say, if only I didn't have this boss, I could get more work done. And then the youth. No, you don't know my relationship with my boss. I wish you would stop making arbitrary guesses, the philosopher. This is a discussion that is concerned with the fundamentals of Adlerian psychology. If you are angry, nothing will sink in. You think, I've got that boss, so I can't work. This is complete etiology, but it's really, I don't want to work, so I'll create an awful boss, or I don't want to acknowledge my incapable self, so I'll create an awful boss. That would be the te teleological way of looking at it. So there's a couple of complex terms there, teleology, etiological. You don't really need to know those in this particular thing. But it does seem that there's somewhat a step of compassion or maybe empathy missing. If you were a psychologist and someone came in with these problems and from the very get-go, you're just going, no, it's you, bam, 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 which is very much what happens in this. The youth comes in with these problems and some of them do seem to be uh, there's something you can empathize with and man, the philosopher is not having a bar of it. He is just going straight for the jugular. You need to change this. It is your responsibility uh, and it's up to you. It is up to you. You've got to have the courage and this is where the courage to be disliked. The title will, will somewhat come in soon. So we're, we're talking about the, the philosopher and I guess that's the, the second theme that I'm going to get onto here, which is embodying the individual psychology. So I want to somewhat compare the two and you can get a feel for, I suppose, how he presents himself and what a Adlerian psychology might perhaps lead to in this case. So what is his life like? Well, if we jump onto the very introduction here, we've got a, a description of what, what uh, the scenario is. So on the outskirts of the thousand year old city lived a philosopher who taught that the world was simple and that happiness was within the reach of every man instantly. A young man who was dissatisfied with life went to visit this philosopher to get to the heart of the matter. This youth found the world a chaotic mass of contradictions and in his anxious eyes, any notion of happiness was completely absurd. So we do get this feeling when we, they start to interact that the philosopher is, is calm, this youth is coming at him very angry and he's, he's remaining calm and not 
reacting to these provocations and whatnot. He's very stoic. He's straight, straight forth, as I was just mentioning before. He's somewhat isolated in his own world. So you could say physically, maybe um, this would not suit with you or, or whatnot. Let's not add that in yet. He's, he claims to be happy and he's very hands off. He's saying these things, but he's not forcing them upon the youth. The youth is voluntarily coming to him back and forth over these um, succinct periods of nights spread out over a couple of weeks slash couple of months. In comparison, the youth is, is very uh, angry. He's unsure. He's um, divided. He, he's just not sure what's going on and is really looking for something to help explain or blame his problems on. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of up in the air which of these paths he'll somewhat choose. The philosopher is, is really, he's, he's very positive. <laughs> From the very get-go, he's, he's not, um, I suppose, saying anything particularly negative. He doesn't allow the youth to wallow in his sorrows and, and, and whatnot, which is somewhat of a good thing and a bad thing. And I'll, I'll get onto that in my personal observations. But if we jump here right towards the end of the book, this is page 257, and he's somewhat summing up his views. And uh, in this case, he was saying, you know, you've you've got to learn live uh, earnestly and conscientiously, and then the youth, the youth is struggling with this and and not going. Like, he's like unsure. He's not not. What do you mean by that? And so we'll go here. Philosopher, not having objectives or the like is fine. Living earnestly here and now is itself a dance. One must not get too serious. Please do not confuse being earnest with being too serious. Youth, be earnest but not too serious. Philosopher, that's right. Life is always simple, not something that one needs to get too serious about. If one is living each moment earnestly, there is no need to get too serious. And there is another thing I would like you to keep in mind. When one has adopted an energial viewpoint, life is always complete. Youth, it's complete? Question mark. Philosopher, if your life or mine for that matter were to come to an end here and now, it would not do to refer to either of them as unhappy. The life that ends at the age of 20 and the life that ends at 90 are both complete lives and lives of happiness. Youth, so if I have lived earnestly here and now, those moments will always be complete. Philosopher, exactly. Now I've used the word life lie again and again throughout our discussion. I would like to conclude by telling you about the greatest life lie of all. Youth, please do. Philosopher, the greatest life lie of all is to not live here and now. It is to look at the past and the future, cast a dim light on one's entire life and believe that one has been able to see something. Until now, you have turned away from the here and now and only shone a light on invented pasts and futures. You've told a great life uh, lie to your life to these irreplaceable moments. And then he's in encouraging him to, you know, you've got to have this courage to break away from these thoughts. You've got to have the courage to break away from what you think other people think of you and to live your life. And uh, yeah, there is, I suppose, this emphasis on this courage to, to do better, to think better, to act better, to squash these, these things which are maybe scary in your mind and which are, I suppose, playing the victim card and allowing you to continue these bad habits or these things that you claim are, are, are doing you wrong, yet you're participating in the act of, of wallowing in those. And um, yeah, that, it's, it's good. <laughs> that aspect is good. The, I suppose the, the other aspect of this philosopher which embodies the Adlerian psychology is it's, it's very steadfast, perhaps overly steadfast, and it's very definitive as well. So what I noticed whilst going through this book is the youth was using a lot of modal verbs. And if you haven't heard of this before, a modal verb is essentially a verb which indicates assurance or certainty of a, a topic. Maybe this happened. It could be like this. Possibly, I'm unsure as to etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't see many of this, if any, with the philosopher. He's very distinct in his style of saying, "This is this. You are experiencing this because this." And there is no really any of these these verbs popping through, which maybe is is good in terms of um, that confidence that assurity of, of looking from the outside and you're like wow this guy he must be an expert he knows exactly what he's talking about but you know this can also i suppose slightly lead you into trouble if if what they're saying is incorrect or actually unhelpful so i'm going to jump onto page 72 slash 73 here and uh, just show this example and basically they're they're talking about um you, you don't really get it talking about life as a competition and and um, whether you should treat adults as children and, and things like this. And so youth, 
Let's change the question. All people are equal. They're on the same level playing field, but actually there's a disparity here, isn't there? Those who move forward are superior and those who pursue them from behind are inferior. So we end up at that problem of superior and inferior, don't we? Philosopher. No, we do not. It does not matter if one is trying to walk in front of others or walk behind them. It is as, is as if we are moving through a flat space that has no vertical axis. We do not walk in order to compete with someone. It is in trying to progress past who one is now that there is value. Youth, have you become free from all forms of competition? Philosopher, of course, I do not think about gaining status or honor, and I live my life as an outsider philosopher without any connection whatsoever to worldly competition. Youth, does that mean you dropped out of competition, that you somehow accepted defeat? Philosopher, no, I withdrew from places that are preoccupied with winning and losing. When one is trying to be oneself, competition will inevitably get in the way. And then... He's going on to talk about how he actually views people as comrades instead of competitors and adopting, I suppose, this um, non-zero-sum mindset, i.e. there is bounty for all of us and I can create more bounty, more good in the world, more happiness, more whatever, and I'm not necessarily stealing that from other people, i.e. there's a fixed amount and it goes back and forth. So this, this is nice, but as we kind of hinted at it in an earlier quote, he does attribute a lot of what I would say plausible, but ultimately guesses, as the youth said, you're guessing at this, uh, to, to people's goals. And there's many examples of this in the book where he's saying people who cut, uh, i.e. kids who cut themselves, they are doing that for attention. And that's kind of the only reason that they're doing it, or at least it's it's kind of presented in that way. Whereas I, I could imagine a, a lot of, you know, maybe there's uh, actual physical benefits in terms of stress release and things by by cutting yourself. There's just this very, I don't know, it, it, for me it becomes to this section where it's, I can somewhat see how if you were going to this philosopher or if you believe Adlerian psychology, sure you'd get some assurance and confidence is great, but overconfidence to the max, to the hilt will get you into this kind of guru level of Osho behaving badly, but you're the revered one and et cetera, et cetera. So just a, a little hint there on, on perhaps the, one of the net downsides of Adlerian psychology, which will get me finally into my observations and takeaways. I really liked certain aspects and disliked certain aspects. So some of the things I did enjoy was that it's, it's very empowering of individuals. So I, I do like the focus on the individual and I do like the empowering aspect. So it's kind of saying denying trauma in a way that shit's in the past, leave it there. You don't need to determine the rest of your life, your future based on this. And even your future, you, you should kind of be focusing on the present, getting into this maybe like slightly Buddhism aspects. Uh, it's very optimistic. There's, there's no hints of saying, you know, just because you're a short person, uh, that means you're you're doomed to lead a, an unattractive life to to women because you're short. And there's just some, I suppose, moment, moments where I, th I think are, are rather prescient. He's got, he's got a, a good insight into the world and human nature. And um, would, he's talking in this aspect here about, okay, uh, weakness and inferiority and um, superiority complexes and, and whatnot. And the youth... The, after this big discussion, the youth goes, so weakness is powerful? And he's asking that. And philosopher goes, Adler says, in fact, if we were to ask ourselves who is the strongest person in our culture, the logical answer would be the baby. The baby rules and cannot be dominated. The baby rules over the adults with his weakness. And it is because of this weakness that no one can control him. Uh, which I thought was a, an interesting viewpoint for sure. There is some truth in that where the baby because of their complete lack of ability to uh, feed themselves clothe themselves act in the world in a way where they will survive they do have this tremendous control over you know mum and dad's lives for what a period of geez at least six years until they're somewhat able to get round on their own and maybe get some food on their own and maybe even work on their own if you really want to take it to a drastic level of of child's lives and things like that uh, so I, I do think there's there's quite a lot of aspects of this where they they have some good insights into life and and bring things to the fore which maybe you haven't thought about, and then there's I guess the uh, the, the downside which is I wouldn't say the psychology is super um, actionable. There's there's not much in this book where you'll come out going uh, I've I've got this problem and 
I'm going to do this to fix it. It's a, a lot of it's like, hmm, you need to think about this. You need to realter your own thought patterns and how you view this. And then maybe things will work out better or not. It's, it's very uh, iffy on that. And this is where I would say it maybe conflicts with this outer reality. Sure, change your inner reality all you want. You uh, have problems in, in terms of you think people all, all think you're disgusting or unattractive or whatnot and you're short you know, and, and maybe you have burn scars on your face or you you're sl slovenly in your appearance and whatnot, that's, that's fine. You can kind of change that out of that, that inner reality of, of what you think maybe other people perceive you as. I would then say it's in this next step of where you're trying to fix a problem that you have, i.e. maybe you want a girlfriend and you're starting to go out and, and getting rejections and, and things like that. There's just this, I suppose, I, I I didn't encounter anything where it's where it was saying okay if you if you experience a setback or maybe something that is too objective it's too in your face and those feelings those emotions of a brutal rejection uh, from a girl they they might not uh, maybe thinking your way out of this isn't the the only and solely best way of doing this maybe there is some this is where the idea of maybe some actionable, more actionable steps or maybe a, a set of, of other tasks of maybe the scientific method would be better. You know, test this thing, change this. Will the outcome be different? No, go back and start again, change something else. Will the outcome be different? Uh, and you do this kind of iterative process, whereas I, I think that might be a bit more actionable rather than this, which is like, think yourself better and everything's going to be okay, <laughs> which I, I, yeah, I didn't um, appreciate too much. And then the final one, probably my biggest gripe of this was the emphasis on happiness. It's kind of hard to get away from the overall takeaway being, you know, what's, what's all of these psychology, what are all these things used for? Uh, it's to become happy. That's, that's what it is somewhat claimed in the book. And it's talking about here on page 235. Uh, the philosopher, do you see it now in a word? Happiness is the feeling of contribution. That is the definition of happiness, youth. But but that's dot, 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 philosopher, is something wrong. Youth, there's no way I can accept such a simplistic definition. Look, I'm not forgetting what you told me before. You said, though on the level of acts, one might not be of use to anyone, on the level of being, every person of use. But if that's the case, according to your logic, all human beings would be happy. And then philosopher, all human beings can be happy, but if we must be understood, this does not mean all human beings are happy. Whether it is on one of the level of acts or on the level of being, one needs to feel that one is of use to someone. That is to say, one needs a feeling of contribution. And there's getting into this aspect of contribution that he talks about. So much of this is focused on happiness, attaining happiness, getting happiness. And I, I personally, I just think that's the wrong way of framing it as a general life principle. I feel like happiness is more of a byproduct of other things that you're doing. If you've got meaning in your life, if you're um, doing other things in your life, happiness will come along as a, as a, as a secondary nature. And if you are kind of focused on finding happiness, which is somewhat what the youth in this book is looking for, he wants to be happy. He wants the girlfriend. He wants this, he wants that. He wants this. If, if he's, chasing after that that happiness aspect uh, i think i think he's going to find um, find problems with that rather than uh perhaps focusing more on how can i be better than i was yesterday how can i live more in the moment now than yesterday there's aspects of that in the psychology there's, there's no denying that um, as i read out in that kind of sum up section but I'd say overall, it, it leans more towards this happiness side of things, putting a lot of emphasis on happiness, which, yeah, personally, I just don't think is, a, is the correct way to go about life because chasing happiness is futile, in my opinion. But hey, that's just me. So in summary, it's ultimately a useful tool for improvement. Maybe even you could call this the Adler pill. So much of life, I believe, is, is tricking your own way uh, your own mind, your own body, your own habits into better outcomes, however you want to measure those outcomes. I thought it came across as a bit too assured, the, the philosopher and, and therefore the psychology, which is somewhat of a warning sign for me. There is just so much emphasis on this is like the way to do it. This is how it is. And I would be curious as to know 
as a hypothetical, if I could show that pragmatically I was doing some things which uh, lead me to a better life, I'm happy, I'm, I'm content, all these things that they claim are, are, are what you need to focus on. Uh, but I was contradicting some of the core tenets of, of this. I, I wasn't perhaps contributing to others and I wasn't deriving my meaning and happiness from that. Would there still be an acceptance of that or would they say, no, no, you can't do that. Even though I'd achieved kind of the end goal that they, they're trying to help this, this youth achieve, but I didn't through it, do it through their means. Would they be accepting of that? <sighs> I don't know. I'd, I'd like to know that. That'd be interesting. So for this book, did it help me? Um, no, not particularly. I, I don't think I needed help like this. It was just came up in my reading list, so I grabbed it. Uh, will it help others? I think so. I think it. I think it could. Will it help everyone? Is this a broad scale thing that everyone should read? No, I, th I think it. It's, it's rather harsh in some ways. Some personality types. It, it, I just don't think it will be an effective way of, of actually improving your life, but for some it will. So if anything that I said here interested you, hey, grab the book. So overall, I'm going to give it a six and a half out of 10, The Courage to be Liked, Disliked, Disliked <laughs> by Ichiro Kishimi and Fumitaki Goga. That is it for today. My minimal lights, thank you for joining me to this part of the video. What are your thoughts on this book, on self-help, on Adlerian psychology? If you've read any of that before, I would love to know all of these things. Best way to do that is leaving a comment down below. And I would also just recommend checking out the uh, Mere Mortals podcast. A lot of what I talk about in here and the ideas and things that I'm getting from these books, I also have that in a, uh, a conversational format. So you can find that on YouTube and also just in the audio version wherever you get your podcasts and listen to them from. Uh, Mere Mortals podcast is what that's called. And other than that, I do hope you're having a happy day, I guess, <laughs> wherever you are in the world. Kyron out.